Hello and welcome. I'm Steve Clemens, Editor-at-Large of The Hill. Thanks so much for joining us today on our forum on regulatory and policy reform surrounding rare disease treatments. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Alexion Pharmaceuticals, for supporting today's event on what is World Rare Disease Day. Scientific advances are making new treatments possible for some of the more than 7,000 rare diseases that currently impact 1 in 10 Americans. But some advocates say current regulatory measures are holding back further progress and there's a lack of engagement with rare disease patients and experts. Efforts to change the status quo are taking shape on Capitol Hill. Legislation introduced in Congress is looking to improve protocols for rare diseases therapies, drug review processes, and patient access to treatment. We have an exciting lineup of speakers joining me for a deep dive into regulate, regulatory reforms and policy implications for the 30 million Americans living with rare diseases. But before we begin, a few housekeeping notes. You can tweet us at at the Hill events using the hashtag, hashtag the Hill Rare Diseases. I know that's a lot of letters, but the Hill Rare Diseases. We're broadcasting live and we'll take your questions throughout the program. As with any live stream, you could experience occasional trouble with the video. Refreshing the page would probably fix the problem, and I hope it does for you. My first guest is Dr. Janet Woodcock, Principal Deputy Commissioner at the Food and Drug Administration, or short, the FDA. She has championed patient-focused drug development and the importance of investment and innovation in tackling rare diseases. For the past 13 months, Dr. Janet Woodcock served as the Acting FDA Commissioner. We're delighted to have you joining us again. You always uh, accept our invitations to come uh, help educate us on what's happening in, in the, this world of, of uh, uh, not, a lot of diseases, um, viruses, public health, and how to get it right. But let me just ask you, when I think one of the questions when it comes to rare disease, and this is going to not be a pharmacological one, one in 10 Americans have rare diseases. And I don't think that's something that's broadly understood or known. How do we turn this from your perspective to being a topic and discussion that comes up when we're doing rare disease on, on, on World Rare Disease Day and something that's more ever present as we think about how we become healthier and smarter as a country on drugs and rare diseases? Well, you know, I think it needs to get into the public discourse. People with rare diseases need to speak up. They need to be featured. They need to be on talk shows. Um, everyone understands, you know, common cancers, heart disease, the major killers, diabetes, and so forth. But they don't realize how much suffering is going on. Often people they know, um, or know of uh, from a rare disease that is much less well understood. You know, one of, um, I'm sure, uh, an acquaintance of yours, probably a friend, Dr. Francis Collins, who's setting, you know, stepping down at NIH, has said that because of COVID, and COVID in very unexpected ways, because, you know, patients weren't signing up for clinical trials or clinical sites were closing, that we probably lost about $10 billion of combined impact on the research agenda, which is, you know, slows progress in a lot of ways. And I'm just wondering what your perspective is and whether that ecosystem somehow needs to be addressed, propped up, you know, given more time, whether it's exclusivity in some of this. Is there anything that needs to be adjusted so that we can catch up with ourselves again? Well, in general, I think the clinical trial ecosystem needs a lot of work, and I've been pretty outspoken about that over time. You know, we need more support. We, it needs to be easier to do trials and get that evaluation done, because not only have has money been lost, but, you know, um, the ability to improve people's lives has been delayed because these trials have been delayed. Our understanding hasn't advanced as fast as it could. So I really believe COVID has given us some new tools. We understand how to do telemedicine in, in clinical trials better now. Uh, we can do them more efficiently, more IT enabled. Um, but really we do need to get uh, clinical research out into the community so that we can have more um, Americans actually be able to participate. You know, I've spent a lot of time in the last few weeks talking to companies in this world, patients that are in this world, uh, researchers, and, and I think there is a concern. Well, they, and, and the FDA has been given uh, praise for trying to find more nimble ways to work with uh, telehealth to find different ways to sort of come in and, and, and to receive praise there. But there's a feeling that maybe structurally some other reforms could be achieved. One of the ones that has come up in discussion is the helping experts accelerate Rare Treatments Act, the Heart Act, 
looking at how to build in rare disease experts into the process. Have you thought about some of those structural enhancements that might bring voice of patients, doctors, others from, from the rare disease world into the process? We would really like to do these things. As you know, the FDA is pretty resource constrained and between approving a thousand generic drugs a year and dealing with all the innovations and all the challenges they bring, such as gene therapy and cellular therapy and so forth, and all the other work that we have to do, like with COVID, it's hard. Our resources are stretched. So we think, and I understand the Center for Drugs, the Center for Biologics are really thinking hard about ways in which they can improve and assist innovation in the rare disease space. And a lot of that, as you said, is providing more help and assistance, um, expert advice and uh, input into the development process. You know, I think one of the other things, again, I'm, I'm a neophyte in this arena, and I just find it you know, fascinating when you talk. I talked to a, a, a patient um, uh, who has a Lyme disease, and, and in early on, she actually helped to raise the money for a $15,000 study to kind of get qualified and do a report to go out and get a grant. And it's fascinating to sort of look at how those people who find themselves in a community can now, with technology, reach out to others and kind of bring them along. But I'd love, I know you're on um, the, 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 the pharmacological side of this and the approval and oversight and you're worried about public health. I want to talk to Janet Woodcock, the human being who would give advice to people who all, all, all of a sudden find that they're in one of these communities and it's not a big one. You know, how, tell us a little bit about your thinking about what folks can do on the human side of this as they, mm -hmm. as they deal with, I, I guess, the loneliness, the stigma, you know, the resource issues. What, what are some of the elements you see that are important? Well, you know, we've provided support for this to Nord, um, to the Critical Path Institute and others, because now the, um, social media, the internet provide tremendous new opportunities for people to get together worldwide in a community, no matter how small their disease is and actually have influence in how their disease is evaluated, how, how it's conceived of, and what treatments might be used. And many disease groups now are doing, for example, natural history studies, uh, so that for their rare disease, we can figure out what happens to people. How, how does the disease unfold over time? And they can, it's meaningful because then you're making a difference. And some diseases, as you know, there have been what we call venture philanthropy, or in fact, the people with the disease and their advocacy organization have taken matters into their own hands, and they have raised money, and they have sponsored trials. And in some cases, that has been successful in bringing advances in that disease. You know, one of the other uh, features of, of, of this, I, I guess, you know, there are seven um, as I understand it, 7,000 uh, rare diseases we know. Um, I've talked to folks that have you know, looked at a study of about 360 of these, so a small portion that cover uh, about 15 million Americans, but a lot of the therapies that are brought on aren't FDA approved. And I guess my, my question is, what is the gap there between FDA approval and the actual use in a community? How can that be a constructive bridge rather than a destructive one? Yeah, well, I have advocated that um, people put up um, what we call platform trials or master protocols, where the goal of the protocol is to figure out and you know what improves the disease and keep improving outcomes in the disease over time. And that would mean that repurposed drugs, in other words, those drugs that are typically used off-label to try and help people with the disease, could be put into the protocol and you could see whether or not they were helpful. And if you generate such data, then you can get FDA approval. Um, part of the problem is because the you know, diseases are rare and people are scattered all over, uh, it's been hard to run these protocols, gather up enough people uh, you know, to be in a trial and then evaluate the outcomes. But now um, the internet and all the all the other uh, abilities we have for connectivity really enable new ways of, of doing this. And, and we really need to find out what improves the disease outcomes. And we need to 
improve that over time until we get to a cure. So, you know, whenever I'm interviewing someone, I try to put myself in their shoes. And so what I know on one hand, I've done a lot of these events and programs over the years, there's a, you know, a lot of expectation uh, among those who are in particular need uh, and their support groups of saying, why can't this process go faster? Why can't we get mm -hmm. clinical dr trials done faster and cheaper and, and get yeah. to outcomes more quickly? I know the other side of it is that sometimes things fail. Uh, clinical trials fail. Uh, I've told the drug industry, it would be good for Americans to know more about your failures, that not everything is a right. slam dunk. I guess my question to you, and maybe it's unfair, as is you, and, and we've seen mistakes in the past, like opioids, et cetera, but how do you get the public equity right while also meeting the expectation um, that we're moving as expeditiously we can on, on drug approval? So, I mean, this is why I feel like you're kind of in a, in a no-win situation on both sides, but, but how, I mean, what's the North Star in that? And, and what um, do you want to say to the rare disease community that I think is listening to this about how you can both be expeditious and safe? Well, you know, I don't think it's either or. I do think there are better ways to do things. One of the reasons interventions fail, okay, is that the disease is so heterogeneous. And so we don't actually know what happens to people. And so we study the wrong thing for example. Um, so we've really encouraged and supported what are called natural history studies to figure out what actually happens to people over time who have a rare disease. But the second thing is people don't want drugs that don't work because every drug has some toll that takes, some liability, some harm it causes. So we want to evaluate drugs and see if they work. I think part of the problem for people with rare diseases or with children with rare diseases, they're desperate because there's nothing out there. And so when there's nothing, your theory is, well, something is better than nothing. That isn't always the case. A harmful something isn't better. Uh, so it's really important to find out whether they help or not. That said, the trial shouldn't take forever. We should have cohorts ready to get entered. We should simplify our trials. <laughs> we should do this as fast as possible. And there are ways to do this now if we put our minds to it. Let me ask you another unfair question. I just reread a segment, a book that was very powerful, Promises to Keep by President Biden about his experience with his son, Bo. And in there, you know, there are stories where uh, they were taking pictures of medical records from one cancer center and FaceTiming it, showing it to the medical records down at the M MD Anderson Cancer Center. And it's just, you know, it's just one of these things where I wonder, as we're thinking about how to do smart health in this country, do drug development, connect to people where they are, have personalized medicine, whether there are parts of the health ecosystem infrastructure we ignore and aren't. And my understanding is that the health records dimension of this is one almost never discussed, but it's like tragically bad. That's what I'm told. It, are there other parts of the ecosystem that aren't under FDA control, aren't at you know part of the uh, uh, companies, that if we actually remedied the passage of information that's HIPAA compliant, but began to address that, that it would enhance our ability to do research faster? Absolutely. I mean, figure, you identify a patient with a rare disease, but they're at some rural site or they live somewhere where they don't have access to clinical trials. Well, that's an opportunity lost. And when you don't have very many patients, uh, you need every opportunity you can get. Um, and to learn from health experiences or even these off-label uses you were talking about, um, you need valid data from the health records. Mm. And we can't get that right now, unfortunately, the way we'd like. There are efforts going on. FDA is collaborating with people who are trying to improve those records to the extent we could use them. Um, and you, instead of having separate case report forms that clinicians have to enter separately, all the outcomes information in and so forth, we could simplify things a great deal if we had better interoperability and somewhat better standardization. Well, let me just ask you finally, Dr. Woodcock, we I'm sure we're gonna have a lot of folks 
uh, from the rare disease community watching today's show. Not just today, I think this is the kind of show that has shelf life, that has people find it. So I guess my question was an open-ended one. What would you like this community to know, best know uh, uh, about what your priorities in the rare disease space are that I might not have asked or been aware of? Well, our priorities is that we work together to make this situation better, that we get all the information we can on the disease, natural history studies, uh, valid information we can use, we, that we get the right outcome measures and we need patient input into that. How uh, do you experience the disease? What do you want to have improved about this disease? How can we measure that? Those things all, are preparatory to actually testing an intervention. So there's a there's work uh, that goes on that enables and de-risks people developing different interventions for your rare disease. And my message is patients can make a difference and they have and they will. And we hope that we see more of that going forward, that we all work together toward better outcomes. Very much appreciate that message and you taking time today. I know how busy you are for sharing that with us. Dr. Janet Woodcock, Principal Deputy Commissioner at the Food and Drug Administration, thanks so much as always for joining us. Great talking to you.